<laughs> yeah, we're going down south now uh, for the <laughs> White-Legged Damselfly Citizen Science uh, Investigation uh, Project, um, which ran from 2018 to 2022, um, the report of which will be made available on the website hopefully soon, and um, it'll be advertised on the e-newsletter um, and via social media, so keep an eye out for that. Hey, there we go, so here it is, one of the cutest damselflies, uh, plastic numerous uh, penipes. Um, unfortunately, it's not one you really find around Nottingham. Um, its range stretches from south of England up to the north, as far as kind of Chester, and then as far west as kind of central Powys in Wales. Um, so if you're not familiar with the species, um, here we have a male. Um, for identification, you look for the lateral markings along the back of the abdomen. The pale brown wing spots, the pale, two pale uh, stripes on either side of the thorax, um, and males are this lovely pale blue colour, um, and their legs kind of stand out quite a lot in flight. You can kind of see them kind of like dangling down. Um, they've got kind of quite thick pale uh, tibiae, uh, the bottom section of the leg. And this is a female. Uh, females are a pale cream with kind of a greenish yellow tinge to the thorax. And this is an example of kind of their primary habitat. They like slow to medium flowing uh, wetlands, uh, waterways, uh, with a med a muddy uh, bent thick sediment, um, lots of floating vegetation. They particularly like yellow water lily for uh, egg overpositing, egg laying in. Uh, they like unshaded conditions and lush bankside vegetation, kind of long grasses and herbaceous growth. And this provides protection to uh, young emerging adults and also uh, foraging mature adults returning to breed. And they also use uh, still uh, water bodies as well, ponds and lakes, which have this kind of a similar vegetation structure with lots of organic material for egg laying. And the, males, uh, the male stays in tandem with the female when she's egg laying. And you can sometimes uh, encounter them in quite large groups. Here we've got a few here. You see the, f uh, the female uh, inserting her eggs using her ovipositor into the, uh, the vegetation under the water. <coughs> and here we have the larva, um, quite attractive looking larva with their little stripy legs. Um, they've got long filaments at the end of the caudal lamellae. Um, on the, the fins uh, at the bottom of the abdomen. And then they've got an angular shape to the back of their head, which helps with identification. And they take on average about two years to develop. And here we have a newly emerged adult, um, uh, which are, again, pale like the females, but they've got kind of an orangey-brownish tinge to the thorax. Um, and the main flight period for adults is between June and July, and they can sometimes be encountered in quite large numbers in kind of wet, uh, lush, wet grasslands and meadows near to waterways. Um, and they've actually been found to travel uh, quite a, a reasonable distance from water, uh, up to five kilometres. So the, invest, uh, the Citizen Science Project, uh, this was thought up, kind of started being thought about in 2017, just after I started. Um, some of our county dragonfly recorders were getting uh, concerns that uh, we've had a lack of recent sightings in some of, uh, along some of the waterways that made up uh, the species' core range. Uh, so the aim of the project was to update the species' distribution map, uh, examining changes in species' occupancy, uh, that's the geographic area that a species is found uh, year on year, uh, on a national and local level, and collect data for the upcoming State of Dragonflies 2021 report. And to do this, we were looking to engage uh, volunteers across the species' range, uh, raising awareness about the species and its habitat and teaching members of the public how to identify the species, record it and submit their records to the BDS. Um, so it was a citizen science project, so we aimed to make it as inclusive as possible, so the activity was kept rather simple. This allowed us to maximise the number of volunteers and also maximise the amount of records uh, that came in. So all uh, volunteers had to do was identify the species, and then report the date of the sighting, 
uh, the site location and also preferably uh, classify the habitat within which it was found. Um, engagement was done in person at events like this uh, through written, written communications such as the Dragonfly uh, magazine, um, our membership magazine, um, and also online. Um, as you might have worked out, the uh, project ran over the lockdown period, um, so we had to kind of switch tacks a little bit and focus our engagement on online uh, kind of communications and outreach. Um, and we advertised this as kind of a project that people could kind of do in their local area uh, during the periods when they were allowed to go outside. And our outreach officer at the time, Fiona, uh, was very good at uh, getting creative in her home advertising uh, the project online. Excellent acting. <laughs> so overall, we got over 3,400 records. Uh, this was uh, that were entered and verified. Uh, this was a over 100% increase on the five years prior, and these came from over 780 records. Uh, uh, sorry, recorders. Um, and the records collected in 2018 went towards the uh, State of Dragonflies 2021 report, uh, which looked at occupancy change from. 1970 to 2019 um, and uh, the uh, re analysis was done by the Center of Ecology and Hydrology. They used occupancy detection modeling um, and they reported that occupancy had significantly increased uh, for the species in England and there hadn't been a significant increase in Wales. Um, here we got a uh, result for England. Ooh, there we go. That's occupancy uh, up to if you want, there's a hundred percent chance of encountering a species in a given area and then take up a year down below. Uh, so this is just uh, to get a visualisation of all our, uh, of our data set. Um, so this is at a hectad level. I always get these mixed up. So that's 10 by 10 kilometre OS grid squares. Uh, the ones in blue, uh, these are uh, hectares that produced, uh, which have historic records that didn't produce records during the project period. And then the shade indicates uh, the last period within which they produced records. Uh, the ones in orange are ones that produced records during the project year. And then the shade indicates how many years of the project they produced records. And then the ones with the little lattice uh, notches, uh, markings over the top, uh, those are hectares that produced records for the first time during the project period. Um, so overall, um, hectares with historic records, 58% uh, produced records during the project period. Uh, they were re-recorded uh, in those hectares. And 41 novel hectares uh, produced records for the first time during the project period. Um, however, looking at um, records on this scale um, uh, kind of covers up any kind of uh, more dynamic um, changes in uh, changes in distribution that we see if we look at um, uh, occupancy on a more uh, on a, a finer scale uh, which we do in the report uh, we look at changes in occupancy on a monad level so one by one kilometer square um, and uh, yeah it's looked at at uh, vice county level um, so this is just a few examples so here we have records for dorset um, if you look at the stour and um, see that we've been a lack of recent records on the upper tributaries in recent years. Um, however, uh, the species was recorded quite far away at novel sites uh, at some woods east of Hermitage and at new, a new site at Laymore Pond. Then we go to South East Essex. Uh, the River Roding was the species kind of historic um, main w uh, waterway. However, that's produced limited recent sightings. But again, a number of um, Still water bodies have produced records for the first time. Uh, ponds at RHS Hyde Hall and also Hanningfield Reservoir. 
Um, so uh, overall, uh, there has been an increase in occupancy in England from 1970 to 2019. Uh, no significant change in Wales. Um, and there's been notable changes in distribution on a vice county level with monarch gains and losses. Um, but what does this reflect? Um, well, it probably reflects that there's been a change in the location and availability of suitable breeding habitat, and then the species is able to respond to this by dispersing to new habitats when it becomes available for breeding in. Um, as we mentioned, uh, they can disperse quite a distance, and this means they're act able to actively colonise new sites. And it may also uh, indicate, uh, reflect the species' utilisation of low tick wetlands um, more frequently. Um, so in the project, we asked for people to um, provide a basic categorisation of uh, the habitat within which they found the species. For those that entered wetland habitats, um, flow water habitat made up 63% of the records, uh, rivers were the most common, um, and then 37% uh, were still water, with ponds being the most frequent. Um, and we have limited um, our record, historic records. Uh, very few have habitat data um, associated with them. Um, but if you talk to kind of, we're talking to a kind of long-term recorders, a lot of them have um, observed that the species is more frequently being found in still water habitats. And it has been theorised that this may be related to climate change in some way. Um, so the species is at its northern uh, edge of its range in Europe. It's found across much of central and southern Europe. And if you in reading the European guides, um, it's uh, listed as being more um, more associated with still water habitats um, in the south of Europe. So there could potentially be a, a link there somewhere, although we don't really understand the mechanisms. But what causes a spe uh, the species to be lost from a wetland? Um, well, it could be due to changes in water quality. Um, so the species isn't believed to be more um, sensitive to pollution than other larvae, although all larvae are sensitive to some degree. So it could be due to an increase in nutrients levels, um, which can result in algal blooms, which reduce um, levels of oxygenated water, uh, levels of oxygen within the water. Um, it could do, be to do with uh, changes in um, the aquatic vegetation structure. If activities such as dredging have taken place, uh, which have removed uh, vegetation for egg laying, um, obviously this will um, reduce the habitat suitability. Um, also, dredging can result in the removal of benthic uh, sediment and also deepen um, wet, uh, waterways and fasten, uh, make the flow, water flow faster. Um, and this then makes it harder for species of plant like the yellow water lily to then recolonise uh, the waterway. Um, another one, it could be changes to the riparian vegetation structure. Um, if there's been um, significant bankside vegetation clearance before or during uh, the breeding season, um, uh, this will, make, again, make the, um, the, the waterway less suitable uh, for the species. Um, but then conversely, if um, no vegetation management is... Um, carried out, then you end up with um, succession <laughs> leading to the development of scrub and tree growth, which results in shaded conditions, uh, which the species is not particularly keen on. It prefers nice, sunny conditions, like me. Um, and... Do, do, do. But, I mean, as we said, the species isn't decreasing in occupancy overall, so why are we fussed about... What, um, the uh, changes to the habitat, which are leading to uh, uh, local extinction. Um, well, species, uh, loss of white-legged damselfly within a wetland could um, indicate an overall decline in the e ecological value um, of a, uh, a wetland system. Um, and this has wider implications for other species um, which are more threatened. Uh, for example, uh, the uh, common club tail on the screen, Gomphus fulgatismus, uh, which is a species which has uh, limited distribution in England and Wales. It's only found on a handful of um, uh, river systems um, and often shares its habitat uh, with white-legged damselflies, uh, which it often likes to munch on as well. Um, so an example would be um, the River Wye, and on its tributary, the River Lug, for example, we have, there are many concerns about uh, the dragonflies' um, on this system. Um, the river lug has um, a scattering of historic club tail, uh, re historic club tail records, um, as well as uh, white-legged damselfly records, uh, but neither produced 
records during their respective citizen science projects. Um, we ran the club tail count project from 2017 to 2019, um, and no club tail um, exuvia were found uh, during uh, these searches. Um, and this river, um, the river, the lower river lug, um, is a triple SI site, which is currently classified as um, unfavourable declining due to nutrients input uh, from sources such as poultry units. Um, so, again, um, white-legged damselfly and common club tail um, are probably being impacted by the same kind of negative activities on this river system. So, next step is to improve our understanding of the species' habitat requirements. Um, so, there's limited... Uh, that we have a general understanding of what the species likes, but we need to do uh, more work on uh, kind of quantitative re uh, research um, allowing us to better classify the features that the species needs to complete its life cycle. And also look at things like the link between potentially the species using uh, ponds and still water bodies uh, more frequently and whether this has anything to do with climate change. Um, and also uh, looking at the data, uh, our ne my next step will be to confirm species loss um, along the waterways which have not produced recent results um, and to talk to CDRs and local court recorders uh, to get a better understanding of these waterways, uh, revisit sites, uh, collect more detail on, hab on habitat, um, survey habitat, and also examine uh, environmental data, uh, such as water quality data um, available via uh, the EA. Um, and that's me. Um. <laughs>